mic drop sounded awkward big bang was doing it right while bts actually ended up being a copy of 1d and jonas brothers butter was released because big hit needed the money when they had to refund ticket holders of map of the soul tour the tour of bts that was cancelled txt was a failure jyp also failed with wonder girls and western artists were the ones that were reaching out to big bang for a collaboration on the other hand bts was actually stuck with their collaborations with no-name artists like steve aoki these are some of the things that i picked up from pop cast the controversial podcast under new york times and the title of that specific episode is John bts jungkook and english language k-pop literally more than a hundred of you actually sent me a message and emails asking me to do a reaction on this you said that you guys were too high on your emotions you're too angry to be to have an objective opinion on the matter so you needed somebody that's level-headed and at first i didn't want to listen to it but because i always value that you trust me i will never take that for granted you count on me to provide you with an objective opinion and a calm one <laughs> so i that in itself actually made me want to watch it so i listened to it twice and i also asked almighty ai to do a transcription of the episode so if you want to read through the transcript of the episode the link is in the description box so that you can also form your objective opinion and here is my take as level-headed and as objective as i could I happen to think that criticisms are healthy. I think it's an integral part of the growth of an artist or an art. I also think that it contributes to the growth of fans like us. It is it's being able to see things from the point of view of somebody else with a different background, different education, beliefs, principles, experiences. I think that's always healthy. I also think that people with an opposing opinion should be allowed to freely express their views and they should be respected for it. I may not always agree with what you're saying, but I will fight for your right to say them. I think that should be everybody's guiding principle. That being said, these things don't give people the license to be careless with their words or in the expression of their views, especially if you're blasting to the public under a well-recognized name in the media industry. New York Times carries with it some credibility and the bigger the name is, the more established the name is, the more responsible you have to be. And I think that's the one thing they weren't in this episode. They weren't responsible. The podcast right from the get-go had it was a it had a very clear assumption and that is BTS is a sellout. They didn't use that word, they used the word concession, but they were very clear on that. There is absolutely nothing wrong, as I've said, with criticizing somebody and absolutely nothing wrong with being hyper focused in your topic. You don't have the time in the all the time in the world. But if you're criticizing somebody, especially if it's somebody big, you have to be very clear where you're coming from. If your assumption is that they are a sellout, then you have to explain how you came to that conclusion. And they did not. So th these are two of the fundamental mistakes they did, in my opinion, in this podcast. Number one, there was absolutely no substantiation in any of their opinions or their claims. They were just saying things, but they weren't explaining them. There was no um, background, no substance to it. And number two, they provided a lot of wrong opinions. So it could be because of the lack of research or maybe incompetent research. I don't know. Okay, let's go to the first one. Right from the get-go, they established that Big Bang 21 are the ones who were doing it right in terms of going global. John Karamanica, the host of the podcast, immediately threw in a complex question fallacy or a loaded question. A loaded question is when the question contains a controversial assumption. This is often used when an interviewer has a given bias or is fishing for a specific narrative in an interview rather than getting an objective information or going for the truth. So for example, I want to interview someone to get their opinion on who they would consider to be the top 10 best K-pop rappers. I could simply ask, who do you consider to be the top, top, top 10 best rappers of all time and why? But let's assume I don't want him to include GD or G-Dragon. I could say GD is one of the most popular K-pop rappers, but he has plagiarized Florida, Nami Amuro, Free Tempo, and others. Do you consider him to be one of the best rappers? Do you even consider him to be a rapper? And who else would you consider to be in the top 10? It is very obvious I have a bias. I am leading the interviewer to the result that I want. Karamanica actually 
indicated that when K-pop first started going to the U.S. during the time of Big Bang, they were making, and I quote, an incredible maximalist version of a pop music as pop had been constructed in America, Europe, taking it, amplifying it, piecing it together, unexpected juxtapositions. And that to me, when I think of K-pop as a stylistic expression, not simply an expression of a geographical border, but not making any concessions. So obviously, he's saying that K-pop music of today is making concessions, also known as selling out. I understand that journalists are expected to express their own opinion, but as a journalist under the New York Times, one of the biggest in the U.S., he needs to explain how he arrived at a conclusion and how he formed his opinion. With that, that you're simply name-calling, maligning, insulting, not really constructively criticizing. His questions was actually full of abstract concepts like incredible maximalist, what does that mean? unexpected juxtapositions like what is that explain so that we are all in the same level so that we can understand each other and don't say that this podcast is just for those who are mature which they actually imply because providing a conclusion without explaining how you came to that conclusion is not a grown-up thing to do you have to discuss what are the sonic elements in Big Bang's music that made you say they were doing it right and what are the sonic elements in BTS's music that made you say they are but copies of 1D and Jonas Brothers. You have to do a lyrical analysis, do an analysis of their visual narratives, their marketing strategies, and if you like, social relevance. Will everyone agree? Probably not. But as a journalist, it's your job to explain, not to convince. And you will not be able to convince anybody if you don't have substantial information to present. Connected to the first point is the lack of definition of concepts. They strongly made it clear that BTS isn't K-pop but a sellout. Okay, so what then is K-pop for you? For you to exclude somebody, you must have a clear idea on what K-pop is. They kept on repeating it. BTS is a sellout but they used the word concession. For you to have a sensible, never mind intelligent conversation, you need to define what K-pop is. That way, I will understand why you don't consider something to be K-pop. I may not agree with your definition, but it would help me understand where you're coming from. Another example. Kara, with no last name, said that HYBE launched Tomorrow by Together or TXT as BTS's little brothers and failed. Okay. So how do you define success? Because TXT just sold out their world tour and they sold 3 million copies of an album. What is it that TXT needs to achieve for them to be considered a success? Or maybe you're referring to the quality of their music? Then explain it. Do a sonic analysis for me to understand why you consider the quality of their music a fail. Or are you expecting them to become as successful as BTS? Also, that sheer statement is a complex question fallacy. Kara with no last name stated that TXT was launched as BTS's little brothers. So how did you come to that conclusion? She stated it like a fact. There was no doubt, no question, no disclaimer that she was speculating. So explain how you came to that conclusion. Was there something about their marketing strategy? Did Big Hit say something? They were hardly photographed together, never had a collaboration. If you can't explain how you made the conclusion, that's being irresponsible. They speculated a lot, but they passed it on as facts. Kara, with no last name, said several things that seemed factual. First, she said TXT was a failure, but didn't clarify what measures was used to conclude that TXT was a failure pretty critical, don't you think? Second, she said that BTS sounded like 1D and Jonas Brothers because they used the same songwriters of 1D and Jonas Brothers. Again, based on this argument, then I can say Beyonce sounds like Leona Lewis, J.Lo, and Kelly Clarkson because they used the same songwriters like Ryan Tedder. Also, she either didn't know or forgot to mention or didn't mention that BTS themselves write their own music. Next, she said that HYBE released Butter because it needed to make money so they can recuperate the money they refunded for the tickets of Map of the Soul Tour, which was canceled because of the pandemic. 
In this part, she inserted the words, in my opinion. But what an opinion. Map of the Soul Tour had 39 shows. Let's be conservative and say they were going to sell 50,000 tickets per show at an average ticket price of, let's be conservative, 150. That's almost 300 million they had to refund. That's a very conservative estimate. You think an English language single can earn that much? From what? From the $1.99 single CD they were selling? At 3 million copies, they would have grossed 6 million with that. They were also creating elaborate music videos for each time they digitally perform in U.S. shows. No business person worth their salt will think that. No business person will say, oh dear, I have to refund 300 million worth of tickets. Let me release an English language single. And the host, Karamanika, didn't have the thoroughness to think about the things and just accepted what Kara, with no surname, was just saying. BTS had three online concerts, Bang Bang Con, The Live, Map of the Soul One, and Suwutsu. All told, they sold more than 3 million tickets. That's 165 million. They also sold DVDs for three online concerts and all were sold out. The tour cancellation was announced August of 2021, right after the last online concert. They sold BTS memories, BTS merch, BTS fan club membership, BT21 merch, Seasons Greetings, Photofolio, they sell a damn guitar pick for $17. Every damn thing is sold out. Kara, with no last name, obviously had no idea how easily Hive raises money when they wanted to. Is this the money they used to refund the money for ticket holders? I have absolutely no idea. But my assumptions will make more mathematical sense than hers. They were really not presenting anything concrete. Kara, with no last name, as I've mentioned, said that BTS sounded like 1D and Jonas Brothers. But she didn't describe what it was about 1D and Jonas Brothers that sounded like BTS. Well, she did. She said they used the same songwriters as 1D and Jonas Brothers. So then, as I've mentioned, I can argue that Beyonce sounds like Leona Lewis, J-Lo, Kelly Clarkson just because they use the same songwriters like Ryan Tedder. She also didn't consider that BTS actually writes their lyrics. RM writes 90% of it, the rest are being written by the other rap line members and other members of BTS. Suga does a lot of the production and the beats, and the other members contribute in the melodies and writing the rest of the lyrics. Another claim with no substantiation, Kara with no last name stated that Mike Drop was when BTS started becoming a Western boy band such as Wan D and Jonas Brothers. But she didn't explain how songs like Dimple, Pied Piper, Go Go, Fake Love, 134, 340, Magic Shop, Airplane, and Panman, and I Can Go On Forever. How are these songs similar sonically to the songs of Wan D and Jonas Brothers? How are the music videos similar? The choreography? How is the marketing similar? Another thing, when they were discussing how Jungkook's album was very Western, the host, Karamanika, asked then to ask the brother question of is K-pop isn't being stripped off on some level of the singular thing that made it so fascinating? That is actually a good question, but he didn't explain what is that singular thing that made it so fascinating. Again, nothing concrete. Later in the podcast, Kara, with no last name, said that Ive and New Jeans take different approaches. And I agree. But when Karamanika asked how they were different, she couldn't clearly explain. She said it was about the performance, but didn't explain how the performances were different. She said Ive has a different vibe. I don't think vibe is a concrete concept, not an intelligent one, definitely that we should use when forming constructive criticisms. She also said that IVE is more popular in Korea than New Jeans, but internationally, New Jeans is more popular than IVE, and probably she's right. But she said that we shouldn't base it on charts because that can be deceiving, and that is fine, but what is she basing her opinion on? Again, she's just throwing out statements, stating conclusions, without actually explaining how she came to that conclusion. They were condescending, not critical. That's what happens when you're not substantiating your claims. They describe BTS using words like awkward, 
really? You're supposed to be under one of the biggest news groups in the US, New York Times, and the best you can come up with is awkward to use as a word in criticizing a song. You need to explain on a sonic level what is it about the song that didn't land well. Kara, with no last name, also made passive-aggressive remarks like, and I quote, you had Diplo actually reaching out to work with GD and T.O.P. and that's just had a different feel to it. She's implying that while GD and T.O.P. had Western artists reaching out to them, BTS was working with no-name EDM DJs like Steve Aoki. Who reached out to who has absolutely nothing to do with the quality of the songs. What is the different feel to it? In another section, when Karamanika said in 2021, at this point, BTS is undeniable in terms of scale. Kara, with no last name, responded, I would say they were undeniable in terms of being able to drive metrics. Are you saying fans are just able to manipulate the numbers? That's why they appear to be big? Or are you saying the quality of music is bad, but they are popular? Things like this, in a show like this, in a topic like this, has to be clear. They provided a lot of wrong information, so it could be the lack of research because I don't want to think that they just intentionally provided the wrong information. First, they said that Butter was the first English language song of BTS that went to the top. It isn't. It wasn't. It's actually Dynamite. Um, Kara, with no last name, also said that Golden was an attempt to make American music just by a Korean. Jungkook was very, very clear in his goal from the very beginning. He wanted to make Western music. He wanted to be that one artist that can do them all. And after this, is going to do classical. He's going to do Latin. He's going to do them all. I don't know why he has to be criticized for a goal that he set for himself. Also, Kara, with no last name, said that New Jeans and Lesser of Him success and recognition in the U.S. is because of Scooter Braun and all the industry connections that he has. Yeah, but Jimin, V, Suga, RMJ, Hope did not get the Western support. They had barely, Jimin had one Western talk show guesting and no radio spin, even though he hit Billboard Hot 100. Suga had a very successful tour, one talk show guesting and no radio spin. RM had no talk show guesting, no radio spins. J same with J-Hope and same with V. Just because they are under hype doesn't guarantee that they're going to be successful in the U.S. as a solo artist or as a group. The only big break that Lesser of Him got is singing the song, the OST of Overwatch. And, and that's very recent. And the big break of New Jeans would be singing the OST of League of Legends, but League of Legends is actually more popular in Asia. I, so the Scooter Braun thing is not a guarantee just because you have Scooter Braun will not make you successful. It's not even going to guarantee any kind of exposure. Okay, so this has actually gone long longer than I expected. I'm so very sorry. But um, I'm going to say something that a lot of you will probably disagree with, but I cannot in good conscience say that they are racist. I think that they, are, they were out to criticize BTS and they just didn't have enough substance to do so so they resorted to providing abstract concepts instead of something concrete they either didn't do enough research or opted to provide the wrong information i don't want to think that they opted to provide the wrong information which actually invalidate all of the conclusions that they have i think there is a lot to be said about Kara not wanting to show her face or not wanting to reveal her identity this is how bullying actually became so rampant online it's one thing to be a commenter right but having a show and choosing to make your opinions very public and those things can actually affect people's dispositions they it can affect um people's career it can influence other people in how they think and who they support you should be held accountable if you want the influence then you should be held accountable and you have to be responsible for the things that you're saying it is her right not to reveal her identity and quite frankly i don't blame her but it is not someone i would give any kind of credence to i I want conversations on a human level when it comes to critical opinions, especially when it comes to art. Not a conversation with some voice from behind the machine or whatever. If you have a strong opinion, then then 
and you think that it is important enough for you to take it to a public platform and influence other people, then you should have the decency, the dignity, and the responsibility to be accountable for the things that you're saying. But I understand she has a family, probably she wants to protect them. But then again, there are a lot of other people who are doing it being public, but their family is protected because... You know, believe it or not, for the most part, people are actually very respectful of public people's families. They respect that. So to all of you, one thing I would say is that I think um, they I think they were irresponsible. They were definitely incompetent on this particular episode. I can't say much about the other things that they are doing. But I think that you can't fault them for not liking BTS. I can't fault them for that. Um, it is their taste. But I do think that you have way more productive things that you can do than pay them any mind. So I know that you, you know, there's, you, you can be more productive. So just do those things and leave them, just, you know, ignore them, I guess. Um, as I've said, if, if they want, I, I will, I will continue listening to them if they will substantiate their claims and if they will do proper research. But without those two foundations the basics of all basics i don't think any of the arguments stands okay i hope i helped um let's all move on <laughs> we have a lot more things to do more productive things to do thank you so much for listening this is longer than i expected um if you want to share your opinion please do so in the comment section no no just be respectful no bullying or anything and um, you can always get in touch with me in any of the social media links that you see on your screen right now. And if you do end up liking this video, please give it a like. Also subscribe and hit that notification button and uh, share the video if you can. Please uh, follow me on Twitter, uh, Asian EAC. And uh, everything this personal is just going to go to my Instagram. Thank you. <laughs>